today um, I wanted to give you a message that I've titled A Place Called Hope. A Place Called Hope. Um, let's look at, if you brought your Bibles, uh, let's look at 1 Peter 1 3. Bring your Bibles. Amen. Amen. All right. I just believe that you're here for a purpose, that you have set aside today to come to hear the Word of God and to receive what uh, He's got for you. So you are the blessed ones. Not that the other people that were supposed to be here are not blessed. <laughs> they yeah. are. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm like uh, Pastor Sharon there, that uh, God has a blessing for each one today, and I'm so glad that you're here to receive what he's got for you. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Father, we just thank you. We lift up our time together here with you today, Father. I just thank you for the opportunity to minister to these wonderful ladies. And Father, I believed that, they, that you ordained them to be here today, that you wanted to speak to their hearts you wanted to minister to them. You wanted to bless them in a special way, Father. So I thank you, Father, that they have come with hearts to receive, ears to hear, hearts and spirit open to receive that which you would impart, Father. Through this vessel, Father, I set myself aside, Father, to allow the Holy Spirit to just work through me, speak through me, minister through me, and we'll be sure to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So praise God, his great mercy caused us to be born again. He desired for us to, to come into that, that eternal relationship with him through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been born again to a living hope. That hope is in Christ Jesus. That hope that we have that assurance of eternal life will be with him forever. And 1 Peter 1.21, let's look at that. 1 Peter 1.21. Let's back up, I guess, to verse 19. And I'm reading the Amplified. But you were purchased with the precious blood of Christ, the Messiah, like that of a sacrificial lamb without blemish or spot. It is true that he was chosen and foreordained, destined and foreknown for it, before the foundation of the world. But he was brought out to public view, made manifest in these last days, at the end of the times, for the sake of you. See, he did it for us. He did it for us. What an what awesome thought. Through him, you believe, adhere to, rely on God, who raised him up from the dead and gave him honor and glory, so that your faith and hope are centered and they rest in God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we have his glory. We have everything that he desires for us to have. And he's given us faith and hope in him. So, what I want to ask you this morning is, are you ready to step into that place that God has put inside of you? The, the ideas, maybe the visions, the dreams that you have, everybody should have some sort of a, of a vision for the future or a goal that God has given you. And it's not something that we just decide on January 1st that we're going to make some resolutions and we're, we're going to change some things and that sort of thing. But we want to set some goals, and we want to find out how to achieve those goals. So God's got a plan for each one of us. He's got a destiny. Because you know Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans for good and not for evil, not for calamity, not for disaster. For good, for that you would prosper and that you would have a future and what? A hope. A hope. So we're going to talk today about this place called hope. Abraham was given the promise of an heir. We know that. God told him that uh, he would become the father of many nations. Uh, and so he uh, began with hope. 
he began with hope. So he, he uh, had a hope that that promise would be fulfilled, uh, that he would have a child eventually. And he learned about faith along the way. He started with hope, but he learned about faith. He didn't jump right into, I know so, I know so. He did trust God. He put it into God's hands. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how he grew in faith. So what can you do to bring about the fulfillment of what you're believing for? What has God put inside of you? What are you, if we can use the term, pregnant with? What's on the inside of you that's growing that is a vision for something for the future? Or it's a, um, a goal or an idea that God's placed in you that you know, I didn't think that up myself. That must be God. It might seem to be an impossible thing, and you don't know how it would come about, but if God plants it in your spirit, then you can be sure that it's going to come about, it's going to happen. But we have things that we need to do in the meantime. So what does he want you to do with the dream that he's given you, with the ideas, the goals, the visions? No matter what you're facing, don't give up on it. Don't become discouraged. But work through difficulties that you might have, because Satan comes in to throw hindrances in our way to, so that we cannot accomplish what God has shown us. So don't give up on your dream. Keep fighting, okay? It's worth fighting for. It's worth standing for. It's worth enduring or working through any difficulties that you might have along the way until it becomes a reality. See, if you have a goal out here or a vision out here, it's not reality yet, is it? It hasn't come to pass. And you want it to come to pass. You want it to be accomplished. And so you have to uh, sometimes even do uh, spiritual warfare. You have to fight through uh, to obtain what God wants you to have. So in this way, you push forward, push forward, so that you can reach God's destiny for your life. And you know what? We're never too young and we're never too old for God to plant seeds within us for things of the future, things that he wants us to accomplish. Uh, and so he has that plan for us. So let's talk about what is hope. What is hope? Well, we can say, first of all, it's confident expectancy. Expectancy. It means to anticipate with pleasure. Hope is the expectation of something good, something good. And hope is waiting. We have to wait many times, so it takes patience, doesn't it? So hope doesn't arise from just something that you think of or a desire that you want or you wish, but it comes from God. He puts that inside of you because he is the believer's hope. He is our hope. David said in Psalm 39, 7, And now, Lord, what do I wait for and expect? My hope and expectation are in you. And in the New Living, <clears throat> he says, Oh, so And so, Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. And so if we're hoping out here in the natural realm somewhere, we can get very discouraged. But if we realize our hope is in him, he is the one that's planted it within us. Hope distinguishes the Christian from the non-Christian or the unbeliever. Um, and the unbeliever, of course, has no hope. The scripture says, you know, that uh, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So we, had, we did not have real hope before we were born again, did we? We could hope. We could hope things would happen, that something would come to pass and all. But we didn't have any foundation. We didn't have anything to base it on as unbelievers. But when we were born again, and God placed that hope within us, that's eternal. And uh, so now it's a different way of believing for us. Hope is that expectation within the believer, the firm assurance about things that perhaps we don't know in the future. But he's put that hope within us. Romans 8, 24, and 25, if you want to look that up. Romans 8, 24, and 25. For we were saved in this hope, 
but hope that is seen is not hope. And we'll see why. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance, with patience. Hallelujah. So hope is expectancy, but it's waiting too. It's learning how to wait and trust God until that which we are believing for comes to pass. Hope is a goal setter. That's another characteristic of hope. It's a goal setter. It's in the future. It's in the future. It's not now. It's something that we want to come to pass in the future. It's a place of vision. A place of vision. Uh, in Habakkuk, okay, now you've got to go to the Old Testament, Habakkuk, and it's between uh, Nahum and Zephaniah, near the end of the Old Testament. <coughs> Habakkuk. And this is Habakkuk the prophet speaking. And he says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly as he hastens by. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and it hastens to the end. Fulfillment. That's what it is. In the end, it's fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint, though it tarry, wait earnestly for it, because it will surely come. It will not be behindhand on its appointed day. So God's always on time, isn't he? Amen. But he isn't on our timetable. <laughs> We'd like to have him on our timetable, but he's not on our timetable. And many times we have to wait, and he says with perseverance or patience, we have to wait, and we have to trust him. Because if his word has promised it, then it will come to pass. And if you're praying about something and believing something uh, that you feel is from God, then he's faithful to his word. If it's from God, it's going to happen. It may take a while, but it's going to happen. So he says, write it down. How many of us have thought to write down what God is putting in our heart, what he is showing us? a plan, a purpose, a goal, do we write it down? Some people journal and they write lots of things down and it's wonderful. I have a friend who um, every time a grandchild was born, she started a new journal on that child. And from the day that he or she was born, she wrote about this child and what God was going to do through that child. And then every year on that child's birthday, she would enter new things in that journal about things that this child did during the year and all the great things and even things that uh, the child had gone through that were difficult or hard, whatever, and how she was praying for them. Her children now are all grown. Well, no, one of them is still in high school. Well, the grandchildren. Uh, one of them is still in high school. And they know she's keeping this journal, but they've never seen it. Because she said, I'm not going to show it to you until God says the right time. So maybe, I guess, after they're married or whatever. And I just thought that was such an awesome thing. I wish I had started that back when my grandchildren were born, and now they're all grown up too. And they're all in their 20s, except one's 19 almost. And uh, so it's a little bit late to start, but, uh, <clears throat> but I guess it's never too late, you know. So, uh, but I just thought that was a wonderful thing. So she journaled and she wrote about these children so that they will see what a rich heritage they have. And uh, so write the vision. If God puts something in your heart, in your plan, in the plans that he has for you, even though you think, well, how could this ever be accomplished? How could I ever uh, see this come to pass? If it just looks so way out there even, it may be something that's way out there and you think, no way am I going to be able to do that, but with God, nothing's too difficult for him. You know, nothing's impossible. And sometimes it might start out as a thing that you think is a crazy thought, and yet as you begin to pray over it and, and talk to the Lord about it, you see it's coming from God, and that all you have to do is cooperate with him and do what he uh, guides you to do. So let me tell you a little bit about... Um, our background as far as ministry is concerned because um, my husband was on the staff of a charismatic church um, as an associate pastor 
And I was doing some teaching, women's uh, groups and uh, women's Bible class. And um, we were happy. We were content in what we were doing. We had two children in college. They were both in Oral Roberts University at the time. And uh, a couple in our church had really gotten plugged into the faith message. And they got excited learning about faith. And uh, they had had a child that had nearly drowned and uh, God brought her back to life and Pastor Brooks, Pastor George, had a great part in praying over this child in the uh, pediatric ICU. And we saw this child begin to recover and the parents came to the Lord through this. And uh, the child grew and they had said the child would never live through the night. Well, she did. Then they said, well, she'll never be anything but a vegetable. Well, she's not. And uh, I mean, God just healed her. And today, I guess she must be about close to 30 years old. And she's married, happily. And uh, so, you know, God, he just does miraculous things. So this couple got excited about the Word of God and what they were learning. And they went to a conference over in Lakeland. And uh, uh, it was a Kenneth Hagin conference. And they came back all on fire for God. And um, so they said, you know, he's got this new school out there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's called Rama Bible Training Center. And um, it's fairly new, just a couple of years old. And um, they said, why don't you pray about, you know, maybe you all would like to go out there to school. And we said, well, yeah, but we got two in college right now. You know, that'd be a little bit hard and so forth. You see how big our faith was acting at the time. <laughs> we were just learning ourselves. And uh, so I remember her saying, just pray about it. Would you just pray about it? So we said, we'll pray about it. We definitely will. And my husband got excited because he's a great teacher of the word. Mm -hmm. And he just thought, man, what a great thing to be able to go out and be in this school and sit under this man of God and uh, learn so much more of the word. And uh, so we began to pray. And then we fasted, started fasting and praying. And at the end of our fast, and the Lord brought us out of that fast at the same time, and we began to share the scriptures that we were getting during the fast. And they were the same scriptures that we each were getting. And uh, it talked a lot in Ezekiel about shepherds, and, uh, which were pastors, and uh, the flock. And so we said, well, wow, you know, I think this is our answer. And so we started just saying, well, Lord, we don't know how this could happen or work out. But we'll just trust you in it. Well, not long after that, uh, in the summer, in August, we were getting ready to take our daughter out, help her drive her car out to Tulsa to college. And um, the night before we left, this couple, not the same couple, but another couple in the church came to us and said, we know you're getting ready to leave and take Carol out to school, and um, but we just need to talk to you. We know you're busy getting ready to leave the next day, but we just wanted to bring something to you that you can pray about and see what you think. And so they proceeded to tell us that uh, the man said, uh, uh, his name was Bill, and he, he said, you know, we've watched young men in this church go off to seminary or Bible school or wherever. They, they've gone off to, in, uh, you know, further their Christian education. And we know that you have never had that opportunity. And uh, we were, you know, just busy raising kids. And my husband was in the corporate business world for years before we ever went into the ministry. And uh, so he said, we would like to make it possible for you to go to school somewhere. And um, you, we don't care where you, you pick wherever you want to go, but we want to make it possible. So we will pay the tuition for the both of you to go to school. And uh, that was an answer right there to prayer. And so we, when we first um, um, fasted and prayed, we set a goal and we put our hope out there. And we didn't know how it would be accomplished, but we were in hope at that point and trying to learn how to walk by faith. And uh, so then that was a real answer to prayer, and our faith just went up yeah. right away. Because yeah. yeah. it was a supernatural thing. This couple that came to us about the tuition, they had no idea that we were praying about going to school. They, they, we hadn't told anybody. They had no idea about it. And so God had put it in their hearts. And this man had the uh, motivational gift of giving. And uh, he's always been a big giver into the ministry, into helping people 
uh, you know, go through, go on with their ministries and so forth. And so they, we said, well, golly, that's amazing, but we receive you. <laughs> and thank you. And uh, then there was another man in our church at the time that um, came to my husband and said, uh, I'd like to hire Linda to go to work for me. And my husband said, well, she has a job. I was working at Tampa Christian Supply at the time, helping get the kids through college. And he said, what do you want her to do? And he said, well, what I would like for her to do is just, um, uh, and he didn't know about the Bible school thing at this point, but he said, I would like for her to quit her job, come to work for me. And he said, well, doing what? And he said, well, I want to pay her what she's making now above and above that. I'm going to increase that. And he said, I want her to just stay home, quit her job, stay home, and work with you in the ministry. Um, and just help you in the ministry. And, um, and I was teaching, and, and I had to pull back on some things. I had to pull back on my counseling that I was doing, because working full time, it was too difficult. So here came another answer to prayer. And so this is what what happened, and I went in to see my boss at Tampa Christian Supply and told him, and he just about fell on the floor. He just said, I never heard of anything like that. He said, that's amazing. He said, that's got to be God, <laughs> which it was. And do you know that when we did make application and were accepted at Rama uh, to go to school, uh, I met with his wife and said, now, you know, this has been just wonderful what you have done, but you don't need to feel like you have to continue this. And she said, oh, no, no. We intend to pay your salary all the way through two years of Bible school, which they did. And then the church gave us some support from their missions account. So all in all, we did not have to work to go to work when we went to Tulsa. We didn't have to get outside jobs. I mean, God is awesome. He, of course, knew what he was calling us to do and that he knew we needed to prepare for it. And um, he was making it possible. And uh, I might add, even during those two years at Bible school, the man that was paying my salary gave me two raises. <laughs> and so God's good, isn't he? <laughs> and so we saw the goal that we had set out there, even though it seemed impossible that it would come to pass. We saw God move in just an awesome way all the way through to take care of our needs. We never had a symptom, a sick day in that whole two years. We never missed a day of school because we went without having any um, insurance. We were no longer on the staff of the church that we had been in. They were helping support us in missions, but, you know. And so uh, uh, we said, well, Lord, you know, we don't have any medical insurance and we're going to be just healthy the whole time. And we were, and we have been ever since. We don't, we don't get sick. Amen. Praise God. Oh, and um, so that I wanted to give you that personal testimony to just kind of let you see that the God of the impossible, He just goes to work and on our behalf and makes it happen. Yes. And so it was awesome. So let me ask you, what kind of goals are you setting? Do you have some goals that you have set of where you want to be this time next year? Do you want to be in the same place? I don't mean physically in the same place. Do you want to be in the same place spiritually? Do you want to be in the same place as far as what you are doing with the Lord? Or do you want to be moving forward and moving up? So we've got to set those goals. So what are you doing? If you've set the goals, what are you doing to realize the goals, to bring them to pass? You know, without a vision, the people perish, the scriptures tell us. And so as we have those goals and that vision set before us, then he gives us the plan. He lays out the plan just as he did with us to enable us to go to Bible school. It's wonderful. I want to tell you briefly, too, a story about a, a lady named Linda. Uh, her name is also Linda. So it's a nice name, isn't it, Linda? <laughs> uh, and she's a dear friend of mine and has been for 30 years. And uh, she's a woman of faith, just filled with the word, loves the Lord with all of her heart. And uh, she was a school teacher, and she loved children. She loved uh, elementary school children, so she taught in the lower grades elementary school, and uh, just dynamic with the kids. And as she was 
doing that, teaching and all, the Lord began to drop something into her spirit. And she said one day she was just praying and, and she said the Lord just spoke to her heart and said, uh, I want you to write a book. And she said, write a book? She said, no, I'm teaching school. I don't know anything about writing a book. I've never written a book. You know? And he said, that's okay. You know, I'll show you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. I want you to write a children's book. A book that will help children to realize how special they are in, in Christ. And so she said, well, okay. And so she started, got her on her computer and just started letting ideas flow. And the juices started going and, you know, she just began to get excited about it. So <clears throat> that was a hope that God placed within her. And then the goal was write it, get it done so you can get it out there to people. So she was moving along with that. She began to get very tired, very and physically, very fatigued. And she didn't know what was happening. She said, I guess I haven't, I'm not getting enough sleep. Maybe I'm under stress or whatever. And um, so she tried to you know, eat more healthy, get more rest. She still was very, very tired. She began to have uh, terrible back aches. Uh, just, they became just excruciating. Finally, she thought, well, I better go to the doctor. So she went and they ran the MRI and the CAT scan, the tests and all of that to see just what the problem was. She was losing weight. And when they did the blood work, she was very, very anemic. And uh, so when the test came back and all, the doctor said, I want you in the hospital today. You have to go into the hospital. And so she was admitted to the hospital and they ran some more tests and all. And then they came and told her, we have diagnosed what's wrong with you. And it's called multiple myeloma. And it's a cancer of the plasma cells in the bone marrow. It's a very, very serious disease. It, uh, the plasma cells, I wrote a little stuff about what, what you need that for, what you need with the plasma. Plasma cells help your body fight infection by producing proteins called antibodies. In multiple myeloma, plasma cells grow out of control in the bone marrow and form tumors in the areas of solid bone. So she had tumors in her spine, and that's what was causing the pain and all. And then they told her through the x-rays and so forth, the scans, that she had uh, small fractures that were happening in her back, and she didn't even realize that this was happening. Um, and so the, she said, well, what are we going to do about that? What's the di I've got the diagnosis. What's the prognosis? And the doctor got very serious and said, it's not good. It's not good at all. He said, this is a terminal disease. People just don't recover from multiple myeloma. It's very serious. It can be very aggressive, or it could take a long time, but eventually it can take your life. And uh, so that was an evil report. But what does the scripture say? Whose report are we going to receive? We report. We we receive the report of the Lord. Okay, just as the, the spies that came back from Israel. You know that's where that song comes from uh, that we sing. And uh, Joshua and Caleb came back with the good report. The ten other spies came back with the evil report. Okay, so she received an evil report. What was she going to do about it? Uh, so she and her husband went immediately to prayer. And they just said, you know, no, no, I'm not going to die with this. I definitely am not going to, uh, you know, give in to this in any way. And uh, so she put her, her faith out there and um, began to, to believe God. And then it occurred to her, but God, what about my book? What about my book I'm, re I'm writing? It's not done. It's not near done. I'm still getting ideas and gathering, you know, information and stuff. <laughs> And I'm still trying to find an illustrator, and she would bring me these illustrations from these different illustrators that she met through her publisher, and she'd say, what do you think about these illustrations? And I'd say, well, I don't know, they're, they're okay, but I don't think they're quite it yet. And she'd say, I don't think so either. And we went through about three different illustrators until she uh, found the one that she wanted to use. But she said, Lord, now I know that you put this in my spirit to write this book. So... Where do we go from here, you know? Here I've got a death sentence in the natural on me, and you called me to write this book, and yet, and I don't have any strength. I don't have strength to do it right now. I'm just so fatigued and so weary. And uh, then she was going through chemo, and um, 
her oncologist uh, at Moffitt here in Tampa recommended that she go to Little Rock, Arkansas to this renowned specialist that only treats multiple myeloma. Now, who would have thought in Little Rock? But good things can happen in Little Rock. <laughs> and so she would go out there and, and be treated and so forth. He didn't give her much hope at all. He said, well, I'll try to prolong your life a little bit, you know. So she just had to hang in there with faith to believe that what God had called her to do, that she would complete it, that that was the vision, and she would complete it, and that she would definitely live. So we'll get back to her in a minute. I want to tell you the end of her story, but I want to talk a little bit about hope and faith and how are they connected. Now faith, we know, gives substance to hope. And you're probably all familiar with Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, we said that hope is future, didn't we? So faith is the substance, it's the foundation uh, for what we are believing for, if with our hope, okay? So faith is the substance of things, whether it's for healing, whether it's for finances, whether it's for family members you're praying for, whatever that you are standing on the word for. Yes. Your faith gives substance to your hope. The New American Standard says it's the assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. And the New Living says faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And in the Amplified, it says the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things that we are hoping for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not yet revealed to the senses. I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, it really amplifies the, uh, the word so we get a better meaning of it. So it's not only assurance, but it's a title deed to what you're believing for. It's the proof of things that we don't see. That's where our faith has to be, the conviction of their reality, even though it hasn't come to pass yet. We're not living in that reality yet. So Strong's Concordance says that it's support from beneath. It's like a foundation, support from beneath, confidence and assurance. All right, let's turn to Romans 4, and we're going to look a few minutes at uh, Abraham. Because he's the father of faith. God taught him a lot, okay? So, um, well, hold your place there. I think I want to go to, back to Genesis. Let's get a little background there. In Genesis 15. Genesis 15. <coughs> the first verse. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. And Abraham said, Lord God, what can you give me, since I am going on from this world childless? And he who shall be the owner and heir of my house is the steward, Eliezer, of Damascus. So see, he was saying, I don't have any hope here. I don't, you know, I have not, Sarah has not given me a child, and uh, it looks like I'm going to be leaving this world childless, so I won't have an heir. And uh, so then he says, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir. He says, That's not the plan. I haven't planned it this way. He's not going to be your heir. But he who shall come from your own body or your own loins shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside his uh, tent, outside his tent, into the starlight, and said, Look now toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to number them. Amazing. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So can we count the stars in the sky? No, we can't, can we? And then he later took him, you know, to the sea where he looked at the sand, and he said, Can you count the grains of sand? 
and of course you can't bring, uh, count the grains of sand. He said, that's how many descendants you will have. Hallelujah. So he was already beginning to put that hope inside Abraham. So he put his, began to put his faith in his hope there. All right, so what happened though? Did it happen right away? No, no. Eleven years went by with no sign of an heir. So what happened? Sarah. Sarah went into action, didn't she? Sarah got herself totally involved in this because she said, well, I'm too old to have a child. You know, this isn't going to happen. And uh, so she decided to give her maid, Hagar, to Abraham so that an heir could come still through Abraham, but it would be coming from Hagar instead of Sarah. And that was her solution to the problem. But was that God's plan? Was that what he wanted, you know? How many times do we, if we have something birthed inside of us as far as hope is concerned, and it doesn't happen, it doesn't come to pass <clears throat> when we want it to come to pass, and so we decide we'll go to plan B, or we'll take a different track. We get off, off you know, we detour and we get out of the perfect will of God. So we don't want to do that. And that's what was happening here with Hagar having Ishmael. And we know through her and through Ishmael, the whole uh, Arab race was birthed. And we know where that went and so where it's been going. So that was not God's plan at all. So let's look in Romans, the fourth chapter, Let's look at um, verse 17. Let's start there. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non-existent things that he has foretold. All right, so he had promised him, promised him. And says he promised it and it worked as already that it existed already all right so that's the way god saw it and abraham you know he was having a little trouble with that but he began to get into faith he began to put that foundation of faith under the hope that he had the hope and he had to start building his faith so he called those things that were not as though they are he began to see the reality of it even though it hadn't happened yet, it had not occurred. Verse 18, for Abraham, human reason for hope being gone. Okay, so in the natural, he had every reason to believe, you know, it's not gonna happen, never gonna happen. But he hoped in faith that he should become the father of many nations. And so he, he didn't have any more natural hope. So he hoped beyond hope, one of the, uh, translation says he hoped beyond hope so he gathered about himself a supernatural hope that God gave him because his natural hope had run out so he had to have supernatural hope and God put that within him uh, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised so what did he do he, he stood on God's promise he trusted God and I mean, he had to trust God when he took him out of where he was born and lived to a new land and didn't know where he was going or why he was going there. From the very beginning, he had to trust God. So here was even a greater challenge to trust God for him to become the father of many nations. But it says he promised it so uh, and told him that his descendants would be beyond what could ever be counted, numberless. So then it says... In verse 19, he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body. Okay, so he, he, he looked at himself in the natural, and he says, I'm old, I'm old, and I, you know, I uh, can't accomplish this in the natural, and neither can Sarah. So he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead, because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's deadened womb, so he thought about all these things, and he could have gotten very discouraged, he could have given up, and he could have said, well, it's not going to happen. But verse 20 says, no unbelief or distrust 
made him waver, made him doubt or question concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Did you know your faith can grow? That you're given a measure. Romans 12, 3 tells you that you're given a measure. Everybody's given the measure of faith. So what are we going to do with it? Are we going to just let it lie there and just, just go on and live our life? Or are we going to develop in our faith? Are we going to let our faith grow and increase so that we're able to believe? We start out believing for the little things, and then we grow with it so that we are able to believe for the larger things, the impossible things. And uh, so that's what he did. He did not doubt. He didn't let any unbelief or distrust get him off the track. Um, I don't know if you know who Norval Hayes is. Uh, I think he's probably still ministering. He's probably uh, in his 80s by now. But I remember he came to our church and spoke a couple times. And I remember him saying that worry, if you're worried about things, it gives way to wondering. Because then, you know, you're wondering if God is really going to take care of whatever you're worrying about. And wondering leads to wandering. Wondering leads to wandering. So you get off the path. You get off the track as far as your trust in God. And the wandering then takes you to a place of unbelief. And so then you don't believe that whatever you're worried about is ever going to get straightened out or it's going to uh, be better or it's going to come to pass, whatever. So we don't want to get into wondering. We don't want to start with worry, and we don't want to get into wondering, because then we're not trusting God. And then we start wandering off the path of, of where he's taking us to, and we get into a real thing with unbelief. And unbelief is a sin. It's not trusting God. So Abraham clung to the promise. Uh, he was fully satisfied, verse 21, and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised. Hallelujah, to do what he had promised. And that's why his faith was credited to him as righteousness, right standing with God. So he clung to the promise and he didn't weaken in his faith. So how did he do that? He had to keep his hope alive. He had to keep his hope alive. He refused to let it die. He refused to let that promise die. Had he lost his hope, his faith would have had nothing to feed or to nourish. His hope gave his faith viability or life. Okay, See how it works? They work together. So his faith was feeding his hope and keeping it alive by speaking the, prom the positive promise of God. And that's why it's so important for us as we stand on the word for whatever we're believing for that we know what that word says. We get scriptures. We really ought to memorize them so we can stand on them and we can confront the devil with that word when we need to, when he comes in to, to get us off the path or to distract us or to discourage us. We have to speak the word of God. Yes. We have to speak his promises. So Abraham was keeping a vital belief in God who can call those things that be not as though they are. Hallelujah. So let me tell you what happened to Linda, my friend with the multiple myeloma. All right, she kept standing on the word and her scripture uh, that she stood on, she stood on a lot of scripture, but her main scripture was uh, <clears throat> from Psalm 118, 17. And I like it in the New Living. It says, I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. So Amen. that was her scripture that she stood on and no matter how bad she felt, how much weight she lost, how hard the treatments were that she had to go through, she still stood on the word and she told that oncologist out there in Little Rock, she says, I appreciate everything that you have been trained to do, your expert knowledge and the, the treatments that you're giving me. She says, I know that God is working with you in that and uh, she says, I want you to know that I am not only receiving from the medical standpoint, but I am receiving from God, and God has assured me that I will not die, but I will live, you know, and declare the works of the Lord, show Amen. what he's done. And the, the doctor was just kind of, you know, and uh, so 
she just brought him tracks and she just witnessed to him and all of that. And uh, I'm not sure whether he ever really got born again, but he had a lot of seeds planted in him. And so what he told her as a last resort, he said, I can do uh, cell, uh, stem cell um, uh, transplant in you. And he says, that's really your only hope of surviving uh, further. It's not a cure, but it'll help you, you know. And uh, so what he did was he harvested her cells from her bone marrow and grew them <coughs> in the lab and then transplanted them back into her, into her bone marrow. It was very painful procedures. She had it done several times. And, uh, but they grew and they overcame the bad cells. They overcame the cancer cells. And with God working that miracle yes. and, and giving that doctor the knowledge to do that. So we work with the medical profession. You know, when I'm counseling and talking with people or praying with people, I, I don't ever tell them, stop taking your medicine. You know, that's a disastrous thing because their faith may not be where yours is or, you know, they, or where they need to be for the healing. And so, you know, don't ever tell anybody to quit taking their medicine because God will show them yes. when they can stop, you know, when they are healed. So she began to get better and better and better, began to get her strength back, and uh, she was able to keep writing. And uh, in a minute, I will show you the book that she produced. So what can we say, though, about hope? What have we learned today about hope? We've learned that it's confident expectancy. It's a goal setter. It's always in the future, never now. What's now? Faith. Faith is now. Hope is the future. We use our faith in God and His promises to bring about that which we are believing for. We are bringing what we are hoping for into the present, bringing it into the reality of it where we can enjoy the fulfillment of it. So hoping on when hope is gone is not easy. What do you do when all hope seems gone? And that's where my friend Linda was. All hope seemed gone. But hoping on when when there is no hope, it's definitely not easy. But that's what you bring to your own faith. That's what Abraham did. He brought what he was hoping for. Uh, you know, he, he had the hope, and he brought. He grew in faith, and he brought that to what how he was hoping and believed that God was able to do what He promised. Um, so you, your faith has to believe that God. Uh, El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough, he's all sufficient. Jehovah Jireh, he's the God who has seen ahead and made provision for you. He knows exactly what you need and how to get it to you. Okay, And even Jehovah Rapha, our healer. Uh, so that was what she had to stand on, and that's what Abraham was standing on. We have to believe that God can do anything. He can do anything. And the hope is our motivator. Hope gets us going, gets us started, okay? So it keeps you going when your circumstances say, oh, give up, just quit, just quit, it's not ever going to happen. If you stop hoping when things look hopeless, then your God-given faith, what happens to it? It goes dormant inside of you. It goes dormant, but you're not using it. Because faith is a force. Faith is active, and we have to keep it active, and we have to keep it growing. All right. So we don't want it to be dormant because then we don't we don't give it anything with which to work. So we got to keep our faith active. If there's no hoping, then there's no receiving. So we have to let our God-given faith feed our hope, knowing that faith is that substance or that foundation for the things that we are hoping for, and then you'll receive. You'll receive. So it's it's a process. So push forward in reaching your goals. Push forward in that vision that God has given you. Push forward in, in achieving, getting to that destiny, that place of destiny that God has for your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's pray. Well, let's, let me show you the book first, and then we'll pray. Okay, here's the book. <laughs> and uh, it's for little ones. 
But I've seen that uh, all the way up to like 10 years old and 12 years old, they just love it because they love the pictures. She did find the right, the right um, illustrator, and uh, I'm going to let you all look at it, take turns looking at it, whatever. You can go on her website, which is in the book here, I believe it's, uh, she's got it listed, uh, and order them. Uh, she has them on her website to order them. They make great Christmas gifts. They make great, uh, how many of you in here are grannies? <laughs> okay, wonderful book for your grandchildren if you have yes. little ones still. Yes. It's, they love it. And what it does is it teaches uh, children about self-esteem. It teaches them who they are in Christ, teaches them value, that, uh, and it's a wonderful book for children that have gone through bullying because this counteracts that in a big way. And so it's a delightful story about this, this giraffe who thought he was ugly. He didn't look like any of the other animals in the forest. And he hated his long legs and long neck and, you know, so. Uh, and then he comes to the rescue of a little uh, hippopotamus baby that fell in a hole. And he was used with his long neck to get down in there and rescue that baby and all. And he, he wound up saying, uh, let's see, he wound up here at the back saying, I like being me. Because he didn't like himself. And he grew to like himself because he realized that he had value. And it's a lesson for all of us. But children need to learn that early, just real early. Yes. So, Amen. Um, Amen. So let's, um, let's close up with prayer. And, um,